Have you been advised to chair fly, but have no idea how to get started? Or maybe you've dabbled a little, given it a try, but given up because it's not working. It's not really that surprising. Everyone seems to recommend chair flying, yet no one ever seems to have any advice on how to actually do it properly. Just so we're on the same page, when we say chair flying, what we're really talking about is mental imagery. Before we get into exactly what mental imagery is and the how of chair flying, I'd like to share a quick story with you. In a study conducted by a researcher at the City University of New York's Hunter College, a group of basketball players were asked to shoot free throws and the success percentage was measured. They were then split into three separate groups. The first group was told not to practice whatsoever, physically or mentally. The second group was asked to practice daily by actually shooting free throws. And the third group was asked to not physically touch a basketball, but only to do mental imagery of shooting perfect free throws each day. When the player's free throw percentage were retested, the no practice group showed no improvement whatsoever. Hardly surprising. The second group that had physically practiced free throws every day improved their shooting accuracy 23%. Without touching a basketball, the group which only did mental imagery each day had improved their free throw shooting percentage 22%, essentially the same amount as the group that physically practiced each day. So mental imagery works. But why? Stop for a moment and think of all the things you do on a daily basis without ever having to consciously think about it, like walking, or cycling, or throwing a ball or driving a car. Each of these activities, and indeed every action you complete subconsciously, is the result of a mental program stored in your brain. And just like launching a software program on your computer, a mental program can be launched or triggered when needed. Of course, you can develop the mental programs to do something through physical practice. That's what physical practice does. It develops the habits or programming to do things without having to think about it. Or, you can use mental imagery to develop mental programs. Chair flying. Mental imagery is the practice of replacing physical practice with picturing the same processes in your mind, or, as a sports psychologist might put it, the use of visual representation in the absence of environmental input. Maybe you've heard of mental imagery described as visualization, but this would imply that mental imagery only involves one sense. It doesn't. But rather than debate semantics, why don't we try some mental imagery right now? Okay, so sit up straight in your chair and make yourself comfortable. Close your eyes. Breathe deeply. Take nice, slow breaths. Notice your breath. Inhale and exhale. Relax your body. Allow your muscles to relax. Feel your feet relax. Feel your legs relax. Feel your hands relax. Feel your arms relax. Feel your neck and shoulders relax. Feel your torso relax. Feel your body sink into the chair. Feel your body get heavy and relaxed. Feel your heartbeat slow down as you relax. Continue to breathe slowly and deeply. If you feel yourself start to drift off to sleep, just take two or three quick, deep breaths and that will bring you back to a relaxed but awake state. Now imagine you are sitting in front of a table 
on the table in front of you, you see a bright yellow lemon. A bright, shiny yellow lemon. Notice how bright yellow and shiny it is. Now imagine picking that bright yellow lemon up with both hands. Feel the texture of the skin and the shape of the lemon. Notice how bright the yellow is. Feel and be aware of the shape. Imagine placing the lemon back on the table in front of you. There is a knife sitting on the table. Pick it up in one hand. Place the blade on the lemon and slice it in half, hearing the sound of the blade slicing through the lemon. Notice the juices dripping onto the table. See the lemon juice on the blade of the knife. See the lemon in two halves with juice on the table around it. Pick up one half of the lemon and give it a squeeze. As you feel the lemon squish, notice the juices on the face of the lemon dripping back onto the table. Give the lemon half a squeeze and feel the juices drip down your fingers. Bring the lemon up to your nose and smell it. Breathe deeply as you smell the scent of the lemon. Give it another squeeze, noticing the juices on the face of the lemon. Now bring the lemon to your mouth. Stick out your tongue and slowly lick the juices off the face of the lemon. Taste the juice. Continue to taste the lemon juice in your mouth. Okay, when you're comfortable, slowly open your eyes as you mentally come back into the room. So, what happened? What did you experience? Did you experience anything like your mouth puckering up? If so, you're like most of the people. Your mouth began to salivate and pucker. This point is important. If you use enough senses, your brain can't tell the difference between a real and an imagined event. And this is the power of mental imagery. The key is using all your senses. And that is why we prefer the term mental imagery over visualization. Okay, so what have we established so far? Number one, mental imagery works. Number two, mental imagery involves all of our senses. And number three, your brain can't tell the difference between a real and an imagined event. So now we've seen that mental imagery can be used in place of physical practice. The obvious question is, which is better? How effective is mental imagery compared to actually physically doing something? Time for another story. In another study, 80s era Soviet Olympic athletes from various sports were split into four groups. The first group trained entirely with physical practice. The second group split their training between 75% physical training and 25% mental imagery. The third group split its training 50-50 and the fourth group spent 25% of their time training physically and 75% mentally. At the end of the study, the group who had made the biggest gains or improvement was the fourth group, the one that had spent only 25% of the time training physically and 75% of the time using mental imagery. Interestingly, the group that trained 100% of the time physically actually improved the least. So not only does mental imagery work, it can actually work better than physical practice alone. When it comes to flying, there are a few problems with relying solely on physical practice to build your mental programming. Flying hours are expensive and reaching proficiency can take a lot of them. Every time you make a mistake, you've made that mistake a part of your mental programming. And only perfect practice makes perfect. If you practice making mistakes, you'll only get better at making mistakes. If you're trying to do something that you've never done before, it can be very difficult to do it physically. Experimenting with a new technique could be risky as a miscalculation could lead to a costly mistake. On the other hand, mental imagery costs nothing. It doesn't take much time 
and you can practice everything perfectly, improving your ability to do it perfectly when needed. Okay, so how do we do mental imagery? How do we chair fly properly? Step one, begin with the narrative. Prior to beginning a mental imagery session, you need to know exactly what you want to accomplish. This is a good case for writing out a narrative. A narrative can be as complicated as a full-blown description of every sensation and action required for an entire aerobatic routine, or something as simple as a bulleted list or outline to help you remember the key points you want to program. Our lemon imagery is an example of a simple narrative using all of our senses. By having a narrative, it's more likely that you'll stay focused throughout an imagery session and less likely that you'll miss a step and program errors. Step two, establish a trigger. Have you ever installed a piece of software on your computer and then couldn't locate the icon to click on to launch the program? How useful would a computer program be without an icon or trigger to launch it? Not very, right? The same thing applies to a mental program. Imagine if you did the mental imagery over and over again to develop the programming to perform a specific skill. You can see it, feel it, hear it so clear in your head. Then, once in the air, you can't locate that mental program in the vast hard drive in your head. Imagine the frustration. It's the very same thing, isn't it? So as important as mental imagery is, it's just as important to develop a trigger to launch the program. Any Airbus pilot would be familiar with the standard callouts Airbus requires before commencing memory checklists. Callouts such as emergency descent or stall, I have control. They serve as mental prompts for the entire crew to take actions. By working standard calls or triggers into your own mental imagery sessions, your mind will link these triggers to their associated programs. These trigger words act as your mental icon to launch the subconscious routine. Step three, memorize your narrative. The only way for programming to be really effective is to repeat it enough times. If you begin to stray off of what you've outlined in your narratives, you are changing the narrative, not repeating it. To use your narrative in mental imagery sessions, you need to have it memorized enough to be able to follow it over and over again without reference to your notes. Step four, get into the right state of mind. Numerous studies across all manner of sports have shown that relaxation, combined with mental imagery, vastly improves the effectiveness of motor skill learning. Just in case you're wondering why, the quick answer is that high levels of anxiety interfere with the generation of successful images of performance. This is probably a good time to mention that thinking about flying is not mental imagery. Thinking about something is done at the conscious level. For something to become part of your mental programming, we need to be tapping into the subconscious. Until you allow your brain to get into the right mental state, you're not using mental imagery to program your subconscious. So what then is the ideal mental state to be in to program your mind? Doctors and researchers define four bioelectrical activity states that can be measured by attaching a few probes to your head. Your brain is always producing some amount of all four, but the concentration of each changes depending on what state you're in, between being consciously awake and being fast asleep. Your mental imagery sessions will be most effective when you are in what is called the alpha-theta state. The alpha-theta state occurs when you relax your mind enough that your mind is not busy, it's relaxed, you're still awake enough to be aware of what's going on around you, but if you let your mind relax and slow down much more, you'd fall asleep. So, prior to beginning to do mental imagery, take a few minutes to allow your mind to relax and slow down. You saw how we did this at the beginning of our lemon imagery. It may take you anywhere up to five minutes to get to this state, but with practice, you may be able to achieve it in as little as two. If you do this, whatever you imagine will seem more real to your subconscious mind and therefore become deeply programmed in your mind. And from there, the ability to reproduce it in the air is much greater. Now that we've covered how to prepare for and begin a mental imagery session, the next obvious question is, what can we use mental imagery for? Maybe you've only ever considered using mental imagery to acquire or perfect motor skills. 
But mental imagery can be used for a whole lot more. In our Amazon best-selling book, Performance Pilot, we go into a lot more detail on how to get the most out of mental imagery. We cover topics such as different types of mental imagery, different perspectives, when and how often to complete sessions, and the use of props. But just to give you a taste of what you can achieve with mental imagery beyond perfecting skills, mental imagery can also be used to develop or improve confidence, motivate, familiarize, trigger a performance state of mind, control arousal, develop resilience, program behavioral traits, pre-plan or refocus. So, to quickly summarize, the four steps to preparing for a mental imagery session are write a narrative, trigger the narrative, study the narrative, and begin in state. NTSB. A final thought on mental imagery. If you initially find chair flying difficult or uncomfortable, then you're not alone. This is a very common experience for pilots starting out. Mental imagery is a skill, and like any skill, you get better with practice. So stick with it. For more mental imagery resources, please check out our book, Performance Pilot, available at Amazon or to order from any bookstore. And if you're ready to get started right now, we've uploaded a template for you on our website. Just head over to performancepilot.net forward slash mi for our template. Happy flying.